We now shift from the voluntary sweet aroma offerings to the required non-savor ones. The sin offering is discussed in Leviticus 4 and the trespass offering in chapter 5. Notice the first words the Lord speaks, quote, if a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done, and does any of them. That's chapter 4, verse 2. God is not offering carte blanche to commit sin. This is not winking at the sins of Mardi Gras if we promise to give up smoking for Lent. Sin is always sin with God. But he did make arrangements for sins of ignorance. In the Old Testament, there was no similar provision for willful disobedience. If they sinned on purpose, there was nothing, quote, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries, Hebrews 10, 27. How thankful we must be for the cross. There, our Savior, quote, gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, not only sins of ignorance, but of self-willed rebellion too. But did he do this so we would be free to sin or free from sin? Here's the rest of the verse, quote, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, Titus 2.14. Thus, the writer to the Hebrews warns those who might choose the God-ordained religion of Judaism over following the despised Nazarene. See Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. There would be no hope for someone guilty of self-willed sin under the Levitical sacrifices. Only one offering could at the same time be both a sweet savor and an offering for sin. Only one could forgive sins of ignorance and sins of intention. Only one was so satisfactory to God that he, quote, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Verse 14. How thankful we should be to the Lord for that. The Lord begins the discussion of his remedy for sin by first pointing out this possibility, quote, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, Leviticus 4.3. Imagine that. The priests were there to lead the people away from sin into the path of holiness. But do you see how contagious sin is? A priest's sin could bring guilt on all the people. How? If he represented them in the holy place, how could their sins be dealt with when he himself was guilty? Thus, he must bring a bull, the most expensive offering, in fact, the same offering made, quote, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally. Verse 13. And because the priest's influence extended into the holy place where he served, quote, the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. Verses 5 and 6. It was considered even more serious than a ruler whose offering was to be, quote, a kid of the goats. Verse 23. And then the blood went only as far as the altar. This was also true of a commoner who must bring a female goat. Here is an important principle. The repair must go as far as the damage, but no farther. Personal sins should not become public through gossip, but sins that deeply affect others must be fully dealt with. Remember, quote, he who covers his sins will not prosper but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. 
If someone is honest about their failure, it is our duty and privilege to recognize it as under the blood because, quote, love will cover a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8. Of course, it's always better to stay out of sin than to get out. Quote, be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Isaiah 52, 11. <laughs> 